Matahari was many things to many different people. Exotic dancer, courtesan, seductress, and spy. She is best remembered for being executed during World War I on charges of espionage. But Matahari was a complex figure who was far more fascinating than just the circumstances of her tragic end. So today we're going to take a look at Matahari, the exotic dancer who became a World War I spy. But before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Storytime channel. Margaretha Gerthazel, the woman who would one day be known as Mata Hari, was born in the Netherlands in 1876 to a wealthy family. Her father was a hatmaker who had invested in oil, which was lucky because you generally don't find outrageous fortune in haberdasheries. For the first 13 years of her life, Zell wore extravagant dresses and lived a lavish lifestyle. However, her family lost all their money in 1889, and her mother passed away in 1891. She was then sent to live with her godfather, who enrolled her in school in Holland. Shortly thereafter, Zell experienced the first of many scandals that would come to define her life. The headmaster of her school began flirting with her when she was around 15. As a result of his flirting, Zell was quickly withdrawn from the school, thus ending her ambitions of becoming a kindergarten teacher. After the incident, she fled to her uncle's home, where she lived for the next few years. With such an unstable home life, Zell decided to set her sights beyond the Netherlands. So at the age of 18, she took a bold step she responded to a newspaper advertisement for a bride in the Dutch East Indies. The would-be groom was Captain Rudolf MacLeod, a Scottish-born Dutch East Indies officer. After a few short months of exchanging letters and pictures, Zell made the decision to travel to Java to be his bride. They were married in Amsterdam on July 11, 1895. MacLeod was the son of a baroness and fairly well-to-do, so the marriage effectively shored up Zell's financial position and placed her among the Dutch upper class. In May of 1897, they set sail for Malang on the island of Java. Zell would subsequently give birth to two children, Norman John MacLeod in 1897 and Louise Jean MacLeod in 1898. Unfortunately, her decision to sell off to Indonesia and marry someone she did not know was a gamble that would not pay off. Rudolf MacLeod, who is roughly twice her age, turned out to be an alcoholic. He also kept a concubine and eventually took to physically abusing his wife, whom he blamed for his failure to get a promotion. Things got so strained that Zell left. It was during this time that she began studying local culture and took up Indonesian dancing as a way to keep herself occupied. It turned out to be an investment in her future and independence. It was also around this time that she told her family in the Netherlands that she had started using the artistic name Mata Hari. It was a bold move, not unlike when Gordon Sumner asked his friends and family to start calling him Sting. You never know how people are going to react. The name Matahari was drawn from the local Malay, word for sun, and translated literally to eye of the day. Eventually, Rudolf asked Zell to return to him, and she agreed, but their marriage still wasn't particularly happy. Surprise! Even the arrival of their two children did nothing to bring the couple together. In fact, it arguably made things worse. Who could have predicted? Both children fell ill, and young Norman passed away. Zell and Rudolf insisted that the children were poisoned by an angry servant, though it's more likely they suffered from the effects of the treatments were syphilis, which they had contracted from their parents. These two are not winning any awards. The small family returned to Holland, and Zell and Rudolf separated in August of 1902. When they finally divorced four years later, she was granted custody of their only surviving child. Rudolf was required to pay child support, a thing he didn't want to do and never did. As a result, Zell struggled to provide for her daughter. Her husband went out of his way to make sure that struggle was as difficult as possible by placing ads in the local papers warning people not to help her and you thought your breakup was hard. Zell eventually returned the child to her husband without having to take care of her daughter. She believed there was nothing left for her in Holland, so she set her sights on Paris. 
after her divorce from MacLeod, Zell had to find a way to financially support herself, so she became a circus performer in Paris. Apparently, they were hiring. She started her career under the big top as a horse rider going by the name Lady MacLeod. It looks like she got one good thing out of that marriage. However, after spending an unhappy young adulthood in the Dutch East Indies, Zell started seeing her new life as an opportunity to completely reinvent herself, and she eventually transitioned to exotic dancing. To help her dancing career, she made a calculated effort to use Europe's Orientalism, a stylized portrayal of Asian culture based on Western stereotypes. To her advantage, she drew upon the skills that she had learned in Indonesia and performed Eastern-inspired dances. She also posed as a Javanese princess, thus adding even more mystique and exotic exoticism to her performances. It was at this point that she began using her artistic name, Mata Hari, as her stage name. But that's not all. She also crossed the line into being outright scandalous by regularly performing nude or nearly nude. In an era when people wore full-body bathing, suits Mata Hari's casual display of skin was downright shocking. When she wasn't nude, she would wear a flesh, colored body stocking, which gave the illusion of nudity. Men across Europe went wild for her scandalous dances. Zell's fashionable dancing career as Mata Hari put her in contact with a lot of wealthy influential men, so she took up a secondary career as a courtesan, which is a fancy word for a fancy prostitute who services fancy people. Men ranging from millionaire industrialists to military officers became her lovers. Consequently, her international affairs meant that when World War I broke out in 1914, she was busy crossing borders. Throughout her life and career, she had been involved with a variety of men, but it wasn't until she met Captain Vadim Maslov that she believed she'd found the love of her life. Maslov was a dashing young Russian pilot who was stationed in France, but in 1916, his plane was shot down and he was hospitalized. Desperate to see him, Zell applied to visit him at the front, but they wanted something. In return, they saw Mata Hari as a border-hopping celebrity dancer who was cadoodling so many military officers and captains of industry that she would make an excellent spy for friends. So if her love and money, Zell said yes. French officers understandably believe that Zell's career as Mata Hari and her international contacts might be of use to them during the war. Specifically, they hoped that she could seduce Crown Prince Wilhelm, Kaiser Wilhelm II's son and heir. They offered her one million francs if she could successfully woo the prince and extract vital German secrets from him. So Mata Hari began her spy career for the French with the intention of seducing her way up the German ranks. Zell's ability to cross borders was useful to the French but it eventually began to raise questions by officials from other European countries. It got to the point when she was actually arrested and interrogated by British officers in 1916 and was only released when she admitted to being a French agent. Mata Hari's brief career as a spy came to an end in 1917 when she was arrested by French secret police after they intercepted a German message claiming she was a double agent. The message revealed that she had accepted money to share French secrets with a German officer at the beginning of the war. Zell didn't deny that the transaction had taken place, but she insisted she shared nothing of value with the Germans. Furthermore, after she was arrested in her hotel room in Paris, authorities had a very difficult time gathering any evidence of treasonous espionage. So instead, they used her life story against her. They claimed she was a consummate performer whose constant reinvention of herself was an incriminating sign of duplicity. In addition, the fact that she took money from a German officer for sexual favors provided prosecutors with evidence to paint her as a depraved spy. Despite the lack of material evidence, these attacks on her character proved to be successful. After all, she did admit to having sold government secrets to the Germans regardless of how inconsequential those secrets may have been according to her. However, a dossier 
in the French state archives suggests Zell may have been innocent of the crimes for which he was accused. As it turns out, her attempted seduction of the German officer was apparently so clumsy that the officer spotted her as an amateur spy right away. Her attempts to get useful information out of him may have been too heavy-handed and obvious. Zell later emphasized that she'd only fed him outdated information and gossip in the hopes he would reveal significant secrets. The officer went so far as to identify her as Agent H-21, but it's unclear to what extent she was actively spying for Germany or whether she was simply considered an asset to spread bad intel. According to some accounts, the German messages were too easily decoded by the French, leading some historians to conclude that she had been set up by the Germans to be tried for espionage. One historian believes she was completely innocent of espionage and became a convenient scapegoat for the French government, which was struggling with an unprecedented war. But it's unlikely we will ever know for certain. Zell was convicted and sentenced to death. In the early morning of October 15, 1917, 41-year-old Gertha Zell Aka Matahari was led out to a firing squad. As was custom, she was offered a blindfold, but she refused. A theatrical performer until the end, Matahari blew a farewell kiss to the firing squad that would shortly end her life. After she was executed, none of her family claimed her body, so her remains were committed to medical research. Her head was actually removed and kept deep in the archives at the Museum of Anatomy in Paris. In a final bizarre twist to her unusual life, archivists in 2000 discovered that her head was missing. To this day, nobody knows what exactly happened to it. Maybe she's back on the job. Nobody would ever suspect a disembodied head as being a spy. Very clever Mata Hari. So what do you think? Would you like to have led the life of Mata Hari? Let us know in the comments below.